It is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcasting the man, the legend himself, Larry Rosenthal, all the way from New York City. This guy is at the top of the cosmetic dentistry game. Dr. Rosenthal believes that improving his patient's smiles through conservative cosmetic dental techniques has a positive and powerful impact on their overall appearance and self-confidence. He completed his residency at Montfort Hospital and graduated from the New York University. He is accredited member of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. In the 1980s, Dr. Rosenthal developed a procedure called the Smile Lift, which patients from around the world visit his dental office to experience. In his new book, Open Wider, a guide to smile and facial aesthetics to enhance your confidence, appearance, and overall health, Dr. Larry Rosenthal breaks down the myths, deceptions, and misconceptions about dental care and empowers you to take charge of your smile and the lifelong health you've always wanted and needed. He is the director of the Aesthetic Hands-On Continuum at the Rosenthal Institute at New York University, expounding his philosophies, experience, and expertise in aesthetic dentistry extensively. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal lectures, publishes, and teaches throughout the country, profiled on television, radio, and in many leading publications such as Vogue, Town and Country, W, L, Glamour, Forbes, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. He spreads the word about his excitement for aesthetic dentistry and the powerful impact it can have on his patients' lives. In honor of Dr. Rosenthal, the Rosenthal Institute for Aesthetic Dentistry at the New York University of College of Dentistry is the nation's first comprehensive program to train dentists in the burgeoning field of aesthetic dentistry. This 9,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility houses 15 treatment rooms, a 52-seat amphitheater, a conference room with remote broadcast capabilities, and a large laboratory with a demonstration area, a separate entrance on First Avenue between 24th Street and 25th Street opens onto a beautiful lobby leading to an elegant wood-paneled reception area. The Rosenthal Institute provides a coordinated approach to the study of aesthetic dentistry. Dr. Rosenthal is also a recipient of the Dr. Harry Strusser Memorial Award for Distinguished Contribution to Public Health. My God, I remember getting out of school in 87. I saw you lecture clear back in 87. I've been watching you for 30 years. You are absolutely top dog in the entire cosmetic arena. Congratulations, Larry, for all your success. Where did I get that, that, that bio from? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That, I could have wrote, wrote 40 more pages. I mean, really, Larry. And you're in the most competitive market in the world. You're in the largest city of America to be number one cosmetic dentist in Parsons, Kansas. That's a little different than New York City. And and your videos, I mean, my gosh. I was watching one today. Here's on the Today Show, the NBC News. You remember this one? Yep. Yep, that was introduced to my book. And she was talking about yeah. your book. She was talking about, I mean, how, how do you have the guest on the Today Show saying, you did Donald Trump's teeth. You did her teeth. She loves you. I mean, I mean, you, uh, you know, you are the epitome of the old saying, your net worth is, is directly proportional to your network. And you are the most network amazing guy. I mean, uh, even when I went and visited your offices, I was surprised at going from the lecture to your office. I mean, you were shaking hands. It's almost like you were running for mayor. Listen. Howard, I know you're a long time. The point of the whole thing is that, can you believe how long we've been doing this? How long I've been doing this? How it became a labor of love? How it's not a job? How it's a hobby? How this is the only thing that I wake up in the morning to do? It's unbelievable. If you told me this years ago, being a dentist, going to dental school, going through all the rigmaroles, trying to build the practice, trying to teach them the word aesthetics. They didn't even know what the public, didn't even have any idea what that is about getting involved at the beginning and building the whole thing, you got to feel good about it. But the best part of it, okay, is embracing the part to give it to others, not just patients, to dentists. I mean, I think that dentistry has taken on an entire new wave, and both of us have been lucky to be involved in it from the beginning. I mean, it's really amazing. It was an opportunity of a lifetime, and um, I'm very grateful for it. Well, you know, it was, a, it was an interesting revolution because the, the underpinning technology – was um, a revolution in dental materials. So you were at the forefront of when, you know, it was amalgam and gold uh, forever. And then these new technologies come out and that's what um, Ivy Claire was a leader in that. With all these new tech uh, materials came out and you were just, you, you led that whole, that whole charge. Well, it wasn't just me. There was a whole group 
of dentists that were eager to go ahead and go ahead and get into the revolution. But you're right. Companies like Ivoclaw and others like it gave us the opportunity because they gave us the wherewithal to do this. Years ago, the best dentists in the world had no option like this. We were there. We seized the opportunity. We didn't even know it would work, but we gave it, gave it our best. At the beginning, I mean, every dentist put us down. Every dentist that was doing either full mouth rehabilitation or cosmetics or changing the color or changing the length of a tooth or crowning teeth, we're going ahead and doing major orthodontics. This, the perception of this non-invasive philosophy only came because of the materials, because of the revolution, because of the um, research and development. Yeah, they used to make fun uh, back in the day in the in the eighties. They called you a bondodontist. Who are these bondodontists? Remember that term? Yeah, we were. Yeah, we were considered low man of total. We were considered high priced salespeople. We were selling something that most dentists believed would never work, never happen, and fall fall right in our faces. We fall right down. However, there were reasons why we did this. We understood the fact that if you could be as little invasive as possible, like medicine, like everything else, then you're doing the patient. They're getting a benefit from the whole thing. And this material and the whole chemistry worked to the point where there were leaders in there from John Kanker and Gary Alex, and everyone got involved at the beginning with, with the philosophy of how you could go ahead and etch, acid etch a tooth. And once you could do that, then different materials are out. And with today, we have new materials too that are so unbelievably thin, basic, that when you sit there and a patient looks at themselves, that to me is one of the greatest rewards they have. They go, oh my God. They look at themselves. And now every dentist around the country and around the world has an opportunity to enhance the lives and self esteem of others. You know, Larry, um, I've always said uh, writing a book is like having a baby. By the way, you and I, both, our firstborn baby was a male named Eric. How's your Eric good? My Eric's doing great. And the chef, he's doing great working his. Guts off and, and loving it. That's awesome. But I, I, I think writing a book is like having a baby. I mean, it takes nine months. It's, it's, it's a labor of love. What was going on in your world, your journey, to write the book Open Wider? First of all, mine took two years, not nine months. And the, <laughs> and the reason why it took years is because the philosophy that I wanted to go into this book was how dentistry was fun for the patient. And it's for the public. But... The publishing company said, no, we need more. We need some more science. We need some more um, almost encyclopedia-type information that patients could go back to, and they can make them understand what these procedures was, what the result was, and how to go ahead and why the dentist became the quarterback of health and beauty of not only the smile but the head and neck. And so what happened was all these things came back, and then pictures came back, and I go into – Something And I, I didn't want this to be a book about people, about high-profile people, about anyone we really treat. I want it to be a book that every single dentist could give to their patient to let them understand that they are offering them an opportunity, not only to look better and feel better, but to gain health. And that's the whole key. So that's pretty cool to get an endorsement written on the book uh, by Vera Wang and Kathy Lee Gifford. Vera Wang says, Dr. Rosenthal is not only a suburb technician, but an incredible artist. His work can affect the entire structure of a woman's face aesthetically. And Kathy Lee Gifford writes, no one knows their way around a mouth like Dr. Larry. He is a genius. If you have teeth, open wider. And when you say open wider, um, the R is in princes. Why? So it's open wide, princes are. Why, why, why did you do that? What, what is all that about? First of all, there's a colloquialism. We say open your mouth, open wide, open wider. But that's not the point of this book. What I really want to do is to open the minds and the vision of people and dentists out there that they don't have to deal with one particular problem. That They can change the way they look. They can improve everything from their bite from, uh, again, sleep apnea things and uh, anti-periodontal uh, disease and everything else by making the mouth healthier. And that doesn't usually involve one or two teeth. You know, and, and, and dentists are skeptical and really afraid to go ahead and introduce the possibilities to patients. I want them to see what can be done in the book, see what can be done for them, and see if they want to go ahead and, and offer them an opportunity, for not only health, but facial aesthetics. And what website should my homies go to? You have uh, your Rosenthal Group. You have Aesthetic Advantage. You have OpenWider.com. You could buy it on Amazon. What, what's the best place for them to go 
to learn for the dentist to go and learn more about well, this? Well, first of all, um, the best place to go is probably the um, open water site. But I want to tell you this. The reason why I, I, I really feel good about this book, and at the beginning when I went to the first ed, I wasn't that happy because I really believe what we do is we explain in dental terms what we're talking about. For, it can say occlusion, and then in parentheses it will say the bite. In other words, the patient can understand what we're doing professionally, but put it in layman's terms. I think that this should be on the curriculum of almost every dental school. It talks about the philosophy of everything from the patient's, the parent's responsibility for being proactive for kids' teeth early on in early development, understanding where they can go. They can go to hospital programs. They can go to dental school programs. They can do all these things, and that's why I wrote the book. And I think the dentist should be able to give this book, not to talk about me and what I did, but what they can do for their patients. And I really hope this becomes the bridge of communication between the dentist saying, "Look at, I'm looking at you right now. You don't even know how you can look, how much healthy you can be, how much you can love the way your entire face can possibly change because of this and make you healthier again. You know, a lot of these, uh, most, probably 85% of everyone listening is commuting to work right now. So what I do for my guests is, um, uh, so they can find you easily, uh, I retweet your last tweet. So I retweeted a couple of your uh, last tweets. Uh, so if they go to at Howard Ferrand, um, I just retweeted at Rosenthal APA and uh, a couple of your tweets so they can they can find it there. Um, so you're so you're uh, proud of your book then. Well, let me tell you what I'm proud of. First of all, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of and this is not to stroke you, but I'm proud of what you've done for dentistry. You've really created not only a market, you've created um, you've taught dentists and you made them feel really better about themselves. You give them an opportunity to go ahead and understand the value of who they are, what they are, in a whole different light than they did in dental school. And this should be part of, you should be part of every curriculum. You should be speaking at every campus with everyone else. And I really mean that. And you know I felt that way my whole life. And, but as far as I'm concerned, as far as me personally, I, I, if you ask me what I like doing, I wrote the book, and I hope, it's, I hope it helps. It's not a book to go ahead and... and be a prophet center for me or anything else. It's something that I had to do. I felt a need. It was part of my, you know, my career, and it's been around a long time. But I still practice full time at the chair. I still love it. I can't believe how much I still love it. My hands don't shake. I still can see. When that stops, I'm not doing it anymore. But the love that you told me years ago that I would still be practicing dentistry and enjoying practicing dentistry almost more and making it even easier is unbelievable. But perhaps I love teaching more. And we started out with Dickerson, and we started out with Hornbrook, and we started out with Ross Nash and Bob Nixon, and we went around the whole round. And all these guys were superstars. We had a group at the ACD that was unbelievable years ago. They were my heroes. I had so many mentors like Goldstein and Garber across the board. But I will tell you this. The most amazing part of this whole thing is that we're still doing hands-on courses today. And... We do it at NYU, we travel all around the world, but I, I can't do that anymore. I just don't have the time and energy to tra travel around the world. So we do it at NYU, and it is, it's almost hard to say this and have you believe it, but it's as rewarding, maybe more so today, than it's been for 25 years. And you were involved in that. And, and, and I don't know what it is. I've been fortunate. I'm really lucky. And I think that anyone out there, if you want to go ahead and learn how to be you know, a higher level dentist. It is Koish and it's Spirit. It's all these groups and they're all phenomenal. You should get involved in it. not just to take the course, but get involved. But you also got to understand the mindset of the patient, the business of the practice, because all those things contribute to both your agita and stress and your joy. Well, all those mentors that you mentioned, everyone is still alive and kicking and doing well, except for Robert Nixon. He died of a stroke January 27, 2007, at the age of 67, and his home is Los Angeles. Why don't you say at RIP uh, a few words about Robert Nixon's contribution to dentistry? Okay, Robert Nixon was a, a, a leader, a pioneer, and was so driven to go ahead and make you better. He was, he, he was so exact and precise as to his methodology, how he practiced, how he taught, and he executed. He was a spectacular dentist. I think he started as an endodontist, ended up being involved in cosmetics, which is, you know, it's a real stretch. 
but he was driven. And he was one of those people that you go up there and you watch him speak, and he was pretty serious. He was a little light once in a while, but one thing he was, he was he wanted to teach. He really liked teaching you. And he would sit there at the chair, and I'd watch him, and he'd be relentless for hours. The clinic's closed, and he's still there doing this stuff like that. And he came up with some unbelievable ideas in terms of techniques and interproximal elbows and all these things that he did at today. So God bless Bob next to He was a good friend. He was a great guy. We were tennis competitors. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And here, here's a piece of trivia that no one would ever know or believe about Robert Nixon. He started out as an endodontist. Yeah, I know. And then became a cosmetic dental legend. How, how do you go from root canals to cosmetics? Um, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, Howard. When the patient says to me, why can't you do the root canal? I tell them I can, but you'll probably be in pain for like a year and a half. When would you like me to start? <laughs> I said, I don't do that. So I, don't do, I, I do what I do. So I know, you know, my, my, my job is to try to guess the questions everybody's um, thinking about as they're driving to work alone on their, their way to work. And I know they're wondering, what materials do you know? I mean, we started off talking about that it was the, it was the revolution in dental materials that allowed the whole aesthetic dentistry revolution to start. Do you have any favorites or are you, for you, is it more the hands-on art sculpting or, or do you have big favors with materials and are they a big part of your success? I have big favorites materials. And I'm going to bring it up in a second, but I'll tell you this, okay? When I first started out, I had problems prepping a tooth. I just didn't get it. And these were crown preps and gold inlay and onlay preps. And I said to myself, if I'm going to get involved with dentistry, I'm going to have to understand how I can sculpt and create, and I can make it easy for my laboratory to do something. Then all of a sudden we came out with, with veneers and bonding, and we started sculpting and carving and bringing in colors and laying them up. And I said, you know, it's like, it's like a party. It was so much fun to me. I mean, I don't even understand how my ADD personality dealt with the fact and liking doing this stuff, but I did. And then I started to get, we got involved with DMG and uh, Luxotemp and everything else, and I could carve temporary. Then I realized if I can shape it, I can translate that seamlessly to my laboratory, make some adjustments over there, and get predictable results. And I've been doing that for years. And we teach the fact that if you go ahead and can scope and create temporaries from wax ups, from mock ups, from just you know um, putting some composite on there. I really believe that you become a better dentist because you can visualize the process before it starts. So that made it much easier. Now today, I'm still using a lot of feldspathic porcelain, which is laying porcelain. But one of my favorite materials, is Emax. I love the material Emax. I we used Empress years ago, and I look at some of the restorations I had in 10, 20, oh. I mean, even 22 years ago, I just saw a patient in the office that had Empress, Empress veneers at the beginning. And I remember when we did Empress veneers at the beginning, it was Maverick stained, and I'm at Baylor University with Bill Dickerson, and I'm three contouring the teeth, and I'm looking at it, and I look like glass. I took all the color off. I didn't even know what Empress was, and I'm using that. But today, it's unbelievable. If the cases we did years ago last 10, 12, 15 years, perhaps the cases we do now may even last longer. I don't think there's anything more valuable than a person can buy than a great smile. I mean, I don't think there's anything that, that, I mean, some people it's more important to others, some people it's more benefit, some people it's more dramatic, but I think that's part of your life. And I think part of your life, it's one of the great investments. And if the dentist understood that, then they can go ahead and they can um, really get into the mindset of the patient, understand what we're offering them. Dentistry is expensive. It's multiple teeth, it's a lot of things out there. But in the end, no matter where you are, you can go ahead with implants today, and veneers today. We can sustain the life and, and the dentition. They don't get older. They don't collapse. And they still can masticate, which would teeth before. And they can look good. And this is a very, very special thing. And I, I come together, and the people that I've met and the patients that I've met in dentistry all across the board, from the person that goes ahead and delivers the mail, the person that's on Broadway today, the person that goes ahead and comes and cleans my office, and the other one who goes ahead and becomes you know, in the office of the United States. So I won't get there who they are and what they are, but it is really, really for everyone. Larry, how do you, how do you balance the difference in other arts versus dentistry? Like if you were Picasso doing a painting, that's, that's your painting the way you wanted it, you own it. But a lot of times when you're working on a patient, 
they want you to do things that maybe you don't like. Maybe they want them wider. Maybe they want them longer. But you're sitting there. You're Larry Rosenthal. You're putting your name on this. How do you balance between what you know would look the best versus what this human being actually wants? Is that is that an issue in your office very often? But that is an issue for every dentist. That is probably one of the greatest questions you can ask because you know about that. The situation is this. As dentists, we believe we know what is right for our patient. As patients who come in, a lot of them believe they know what's right for them. They're not dentists. We cannot compromise health. So if there's some things we got to do that can go ahead and it's a bad risk reward, you either can't do it or you got to compromise yourself. But as far as the aesthetic thing, the way I do it is I go ahead and I tell them, Give me an idea of the things that you would like to happen with these teeth. Do you want them wider? Do you want them longer? Do you want them wider? Do you want to build your lips out? Do you want to change your bite? Do you want, do you want to replace the tooth? What, do you, what would you like to do? If you were the dentist, what would you like to do? And they'll give me some list of things where they'll say, I'll leave it up to you. But if they ask me certain specific things, I key that in my mind. And what I do is when I make them temporaries or do a mock-up or do a trial smile for wax up, I will do the right side slightly different than the left side. I may make the teeth longer and one side wider, one side round and shorter. And I go ahead and I'll look at their face. And I really believe if you're doing it all along, it's about looking at what does that patient look like. If they have a long, long face and we widen the smile, that'll counterbalance that. How do we build that out? How do we lengthen the teeth? How do we do that stuff? And that's all of why it's so much fun. It's not Picasso. It's you and it's every dentist out there doing this stuff. It's within limits. You also have to have a great laboratory. And to have a great laboratory, you may have to pay some money. And the patient may have to go ahead and understand that it would be more expensive to do a high-quality laboratory than, some, than, than one that is just you know, average and ordinary. But I go ahead and we look at the face and we look at all the stuff. And really answering your question, if I have, unfortunately like others, failed. I have been stubborn and I have failed. I have given some patients something that I think is the best that they can get. And they'll look at it and I go, I like it a lot, but it's not really what I want. I told you I want them wider. I told you I want them longer. I told you I want them even across. I don't like these little spaces at the edge, which we know are embrasures without spaces. And then I'm sitting there saying to myself, I should have worked on the temporaries. Now this changes. What do I do? Do I change the case? Do I take it off? Do I redo it? Once you redo something, every dentist out there, you've already lost money, lost patience, stress out the office, back yourself up. The staff is involved in this. It's, it's negative downhill. So what you have to try and do is present along the way and say, I want your input in this. Some patients you're never going to please. You can make a set of teeth. I can make a set of teeth. Um, Dorf can make a set of teeth. You can go across the board everywhere else. And we all think they're good, and they'll find fault in it because they're just people that will never be happy. And probably the only thing you can learn from all the experiences is that not treating those people, trying to get them before you start. But sometimes I bite the bullet. Sometimes I bite the bullet. I say, I'll go ahead and do it. I'm doing it one more time. This is what you want. You're getting one more time, and that's it. Sign a release. Sign a thing, and I'll go for one more time. Other times I'll say, I won't do it. I'm not doing it. Either get it money back or this thing back, but I'll say to myself, I'm not getting involved because – you will never be happy. It's just something like that. You got through the cracks. You won't be happy. And, and other times I sit down and I give them patience. Some of them just need to be stroked. They need a few appointments and a few visits to go back and let them see. And then you go ahead and you hire a guy outside. So when they walk outside, they go, excuse me, ma'am, who did you teeth? They're gorgeous. And you pay that guy some money in the street. That's how it works. And you get positive reinforcement. So – Larry, yeah. when I was in your office, you were making most of your veneers in-house. Are you still making them in-house, or are you sending them out to a lab? I'm sending out to the lab because we don't have enough room here. But now we're going to be building a bigger office and bring a laboratory on the premises. But most of the time, the labs today and the way they do things today, you can use um, everything from digital or you can use CAD camera. You, know, you can have it all done quickly. So uh, we take models of our impressions, of our temporaries. We take measurements. We take photograph series of before, prep, and temporaries. We go into any additional comments about color and what we want to do, our color map. It takes a few minutes, but I try and get that product. And I think the most important thing, Howard, and really answer your question, which I didn't mention, is you've got to take control. You've got to take control of the patient. You are the expert. They don't go ahead 
and go to you and say, well, you got a little blot on your lung. You got a little decay in your tooth. I'm going to wait until it gets bigger. You go ahead and you say, this is a problem now. You're wearing your teeth now. If you wait longer, it's going to be more of a problem. The time to act is now. This is what we want to do. Let me show you what it is. Or I did the best I can. I'm not touching your teeth. Living them for six months. Living them a year. I can't go back in now. I may cause problems. And let them live with it. And most of the time, if you did the kind of job that you think you did and you're happy with the result, most of the time the patient will go ahead and be okay. But you got to have a little patience. You can't get negative about it. You got to understand the mindset that these people, people that want wider, longer teeth, it's strange. It's just a weird thing, phenomenon, people like that. I mean, most of the world doesn't care about that, but there are a lot of people that want that stuff. So you got to have a little compassion. They spent money, they spent time, you did it. If you didn't do it right and you want to change it, that's, that's your option. You got to do that. But if you did it right, you think you're happy and they don't like it, then you got to go ahead and deal with that. So your average anterior veneer is an Empress or Emacs? Um, and my anterior veneer is, is both Emacs and feldspathic porcelain. It's built up. A lot of it's created porcelain by Willie Geller, but it depends upon who's doing it and what I'm doing for the teeth. If I need strength, if I need fit, if I have a short tooth, then I'm going to use more of an Emacs material. If I have more of enamel left than anything else, I'm going to use more of feldspathic. I still believe that the most aesthetic restoration in dentistry anteriorly is a feldspathic that is baked porcelain, that is baked on. In the book, we talk about that, and we actually have pictures of that to show the patient the intricacies of how we go ahead and do that too. However, it's, the profession's changing. And now they cut back Emacs, they use all these materials. I think you have to understand what who your ceramist is, who is your laboratory, what do they most like to use? And you're going to have to work a little bit with a lot of these things and try it out. So um, a lot of people are claiming that they can do chair side veneers with CAD CAM. Do you, do you think that's a viable anterior? I mean, do you think you could do what you're doing with the chair side CAD CAM milling? I honestly believe I haven't really done a lot of that, okay, but I've seen it. We had it years ago, one tooth at a time. But um, I really believe that everything is getting better. And if you can do something that way and if you can reduce the course for mo cost and time for most patients, that might be sufficient. It may not be exactly the Picasso you want, but maybe they don't need that. I'm not against any of those things, Howard. I'm, I'm for innovation. I'm for go ahead and development. Everything gets better. And if, it's, and if it proves to be something that is viable, then fine. Right now, I'm not, you know, I'm happy with what I want to do and I don't want to compromise the result. I'm, I'm actually more passionate than I was years ago. I'm obsessed with this stuff, which is not necessarily good either, but that's, that's the way I am, you know? And when I'm driven, I'm driven. But most dentists, or some dentists might be that way, some may not be that way. If they can work it out in their office and give a quality product, fine. Listen, half of my work is redoing other dentist's work for whatever reason. Not that it was done poorly. Maybe it's not aesthetic. Maybe it's the patient. Maybe it had a problem there. Most of the dentistry today is much better, I see, than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. The dentistry, the materials, like I said, are better. The concepts are better. They're a little better trained undergraduate in school already. So, you know, cosmetic dentistry is not a mystery anymore. I mean, it's, it's mainstream, global. So um, I'm for all that stuff. Um, I remember years ago we did things, Lumineers, other stuff, which I didn't like. And it wasn't for me. But then again, my patients are pretty particular. They travel around the world to see me. It's, they, they don't set something very easy. They really want a, a product, and, and, and you got to try and deliver it. And I want a product the same way. It's my personal um, driven satisfaction, self-esteem, that what I did for them, if it's not the best I could do every day, it's close to it. So what percent of your cases do you first uh, do uh, like um, ortho involved, like maybe or Invisalign or braces uh, or or your or most of your patients flying in want it done right now, quick, short, out? But or, what, what percent of your cases involve ortho? Okay, let me explain to you that. It, it doesn't matter where the patient came from. I, I, ha I have to go ahead and I can't go ahead and compromise what I'm doing because they're flying and flying out. I maybe say to them, you have to go and have some ortho done or go wherever you came from and have it done. We'll try and find someone there. And, and, and or you might need crown lengthening or you might need some endo or you might need a tooth taken out and implant placed either immediately or not. Whatever you might need, you might need. And even though you came to me to do this case, I may not be able to do it. But Howard, if I told you honestly how many people come in 
and I don't even have x-rays or models or molds, and they're leaving in a few days, and I see the teeth, and it works, I can't believe it. It's worked for years. We still can be minimally invasive, and some of these people are not going to go for it, though. You try and treat them traditionally the way you should treat them, and you say you need a bone graft, and you see an implant and a sinus lift, and they're going to say, are you kidding me? They can be around the corner. I'm not doing that. That's why their mouth is that way. I came to you because I heard you can go ahead and satisfy this problem quickly. Can you? Can you? Not? And I don't compromise. Most of the time, however, the answer is I can change a bite. I can change the lips. I can change the airway in the morning by reshaping the teeth and doing it. But I see it. I've been doing it every day for so many years that when I try and teach it, and the dentist looks at me and goes, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't get it. So we got to go back to square one, and we can't go right to the end, and then experience is experience. And, you know, uh, I, I just believe that, that the dentist should do good rule, whatever they feel comfortable within their skill set. And so grow- you graduated from the NYU Dental in 72. Don't say that on the air. You I was only five, I was five years old when I graduated. I was a genius. Well, you are a genius, and that well, is amazing. You've been doing this forty-five years and have no thought of slowing down. I'm actually work. I don't have to work as hard as I want to work, but I do work, and I don't get tired. And I can't wait to get to the office in the morning. I must be psycho. <laughs> no, you just love what you do. Um, we talked at the very beginning of the show how. The technological underpinnings was a revolution in dental materials, which led to the whole cosmetic revolution. Has the um, changes in the um, digital technology? I, I remember, you know, they were making CAD CAM in France. Uh, that started in France. And when I talked to those uh, scientists, they said that the prob- the reason CAD CAM took so long is because they were waiting for uh, Intel's microprocessors to get bigger and bigger and bigger. They were telling me that, you know, in the 90s, they had so limited uh, amount of uh, power to work with from the computers. But now that the computers are so big and robust and powerful, has the digital technology changed uh, your cosmetic revolution? Well, I think the digital technology has changed the cosmetic revolution globally, and it's going go, to go geometrically. Because the idea that you can go ahead and tell a patient that we can don't have to put this gook in your mouth, you don't have to go through all this process, we can take pictures in your mouth like you do with your cell phone, and they can go ahead and be transmitted to a laboratory to fabricate a restoration that will look good for you for years. And that is one of the great selling points, plus the fact that I believe it's more accurate than what we have before. Materials, brush materials are phenomenal. I'm still using them the mainstay, but but the, the technology is getting better and better. When we first had in the office, we were doing one tooth and maybe a quadrant at a time. And now, because of the cost coming down, the technology getting better, and the laboratory be able to go ahead and use this technology, which is a big communication gap, and with all the manufacturers getting in on it, materials are better, everything's better. I just think that that, that is another revolution that is taking place right now in dentistry. And the consumer needs to know more about that. They don't really understand that. And this is what should be done on talk show to tell them what we can do today as opposed to what their mother and father had to go through to get anything done. What, so are you using a scanner now, an, an intraoral scanner instead of impressions? I'm not. I'm still using impressions, but we're using some scanners and we're doing some of the stuff at the school. And I'm going to go ahead and decide where I want to go with because I'm inundated with all these different companies. I'm not sure which one to take. And they're probably all great, but I'm involved with all this stuff. But I do believe as we rebuild my office here, that's going to be part of our whole technology and with a laboratory right here. We're building and, a whole CAD CAM system. And what impression material are you using? I'm still using, um, believe it or not, I'm still using Infogum. Yeah, same here. I've been using, first it was SV in Germany, now 3M bought it. I've been using 3M Espergum since 1987. Um, it's hydrophilic. It's great. We can take, we can, I don't remember the last time we missed a margin significantly for full mouth cases almost every day. It is, it's remarkable that the same material have gotten better and better and better. I'll never and forget a dinner with um, John Miles. Remember John Miles, the CEO of Dentsply for so many years? What a legend. 
And he said to me that dentists are the most brand loyal people in the world because they have so many problems with all these different procedures that if something works, they'll never change it. He said, it, and it's like, okay, so the epigram works. So I, you know, there's a, well, no other things to consider than fixing something that's not broke. Yeah, you know, I'm still using the same bonding agent. You know, the point is, all these years, you're exactly right. But, you know, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's, it's, it's good to a fault. Sometimes the fact of the matter is because we got something working, we're not willing to give it a shot to try and do some new innovative product that might be better. We wait a while to do that. And that's what we do in the courses. We introduce new products, new systems in the courses, and we try and go ahead and then evaluate them. It becomes a, a, a giant um, study in what's going on today. So um, do you, do you, uh, what lab do you use? I use primarily Jason Kim Laboratory. It's in New York City, and they also have a Long Island branch. And they have uh, Jason, too, one of the great ceramists of all time. He's um, Willie Geller trained. Um, he's a master ceramist. Um, he has um, uh, he has another side, you know, a second guy named Calvin, who's unbelievable too. And he trains all these ceramists. But he too, who is who is vested totally in feldspathic porcelain, has evolved to the point of being involved in more pressed ceramics and more materials that we can go across the board with. We use everything now, Howard. We use everything. And sometimes they'll tell me, Dr. Rosenthal, you asked for this restoration. I believe we should change this. We should change it to whatever the material might be. I may have PFM. They may want to do Emax bridges. It may change. And I'm open to it. I trust my ceramics so much. We're a team. And I think you have to have a team. The dentists understand the team exists within the staff and within your laboratory and then your specialists and other dentists. And I have a whole thing on what I call the dream team in the book and how we go ahead and seamlessly do things that, you know, injectables are not part of dentistry. All this stuff is involved. So we go ahead and we send them to the best people as if they're in the premises in New York and they may be a few blocks away. And the dentist should understand it's one of the great referral sources and the patient feels they really feel they're in the best hands. It's another reason to go to that dentist. Now, are you doing the Botox and derma fillers in your office yourself, or do you refer that out? I refer it out to a couple of dermatologists and do a great job. Sometimes what we're doing in a new office, we're planning to have a room that's going to have uh, one room to do implants in and another room to go ahead and do um, evaluations in terms of uh, um, facial aesthetics, whether it be lasers or whether it be um, Botox and rest of them. I did not believe in it. I never believed in Howard. I said... You're going to shoot botulism in me. I'm out of here. The whole profession is going crazy. But now I see how, and they're better than ever, and people like it because it's it's not permanent. It's temporary, but it really enhances. It's anti-aging. It changes the face. It does things in the right hands. I think it's it's really pretty safe today. So, Larry, um, this is uh, June, and so 6,000 kids just graduated last week from dental school. And a lot of them uh, want to be just like you when they grow up, and they, they want to be a cosmetic dentist. If you were given the commencement class to all the kids who wanted to be a cosmetic dentist and they just walked out of uh, dental school, what, would you, what advice would you give them if they wanted to end up um, to be a cosmetic dentist? I, I'd use one word, which I use with my patients when they come to me and when people do that. I'd say, why? <laughs> why do you want to do this? What, do you realize that if you became technically savvy, if you became um, unbelievably efficient and, and you could execute to the highest level of dentistry, there's a psychological component that comes in that causes a lot of stress and a lot of problems in your office. It's a whole different way of dealing with the psychological aspect of what patients, not what they need, but what they want. But you have to be a labor of love. You have to really like the whole idea of, of, of creating things and, and, and shaping things and doing those things. You could be a general dentist slash cosmetic dentist and have part of your practice like that, and that's fine. That's what I am, really. But the point is that, that cosmetics enters into every part of people's lives today, to some extent. And some people don't want it. Some people want it. It doesn't matter what part of the body it is. I would go ahead and say to them, listen, your invest, investment in this is going to be heavy. You're going to have to go ahead, be passionate about it. You have to learn about it to get to a higher level. You have to develop a staff that's not just a, 
a clinical staff, but a staff that is interested in the patient and can explain to the patient, communicate to them what we can do for them and really care. The path they really care. I think what happens, most people go to work, it's a job, and you go, I'm out of here, thank God. The other people go ahead, I really want to do a good job. I really want my staff to do I tell my staff and people, when I tell the dentist, it's more important almost the experience they have in the office than the result. They expect the result, but they come out here thinking they went to five, so they travel from around the world, Howard, to come to our office. They did that. When did it happen years ago? No one wanted to go to the dentist. They were afraid. It was pain. It was all kinds of problems. We take them and turn around all their 25, 35 bad years at. It's not easy, but it's so much fun. It's such a turn on. So if they want to get involved in it, they can today. Materials are great. They're going to get better. Digital technology is going to get better. Everything's going to get better. It'll probably be less expensive. It'll be easier to do it. It'll be more comprehensive. I mean, every, every so they should get involved in this stuff because I think that's one of the things that perhaps long term will not be insurance based. It will be elective payment. It'll be a fee for service that I don't see it going away too easily because I don't think um, Trump is going to go ahead and have them pay for veneers. I just don't think it's going to happen like that. So what's going to happen is if you want to not be dictated to, but you want to go ahead and control your life, then implants, anesthetics, and reconstructive dentistry is the way to go. Orthodontics, Invisalign. That's another thing that has changed the way dentistry is today. And we have all these things to do with today. And, and the materials are getting better and the manufacturers are better. I tell them to learn, get educated. You can take some of the courses, come to our courses. We'll teach you a mindset as well as a an attitude and also teach you how to do it, what, you know, how to get ready to put for and avoid failures. You mentioned Trump. How does it feel to be Trump's dentist? That's, I mean, how, how does it feel to be the president of the United States of America's dentist? Howard, who said I am? Kathy Lee Gifford on the NBC show. Well, I don't know. I, I don't, I, don't, I can't say that. Well, that, well, <laughs> it, it's on that, but it's, it, she said it on, she said it on a, on a national show. Uh, I have the video right here. Um, Okay, let me answer that this way, okay? Dealing with people that are, that are very high profile in terms of visibility to the public, whether it be an actor, whether it be a politician, whether it be a sports figure, whether it be a model or anything else, who, who doesn't like seeing someone out there on TV or on Broadway or, or wherever it might be and doing that thing, you know? And the, and, and the only reason why I, I don't say it to you is I think the dentist should never talk about who they treat. And I, right. think, that, I think it's more that, that you are who you are. If she says something, okay, I can't stop anyone from saying anything. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm happy for the praise and the accolades and the, the identification. It doesn't matter who it might be. But then again... You know, I think it's more about who you are and that everybody's treated like a, a, like a VIP. Everybody's five star. And so um, and that, that's the philosophy I've always had. And I, um, I still stand by it. I mean, the people have done a lot of things for me in life. My patients have really opened doors for me that I never could have done it if I, I don't think I did anything else. And the communication you have or dentist has with their patient, when they are thankful for what you do, I mean – no matter where they are, they could be anywhere. They could own a movie theater. They could own. They could be involved with a sports team. They could be involved with anything else. So you do it for the right reasons, not to get something back from them to be paid. But and then all of a sudden, all of these things open. And I'm telling you, it's right up my alley. I'm in New York City. Everything's going crazy here all the time, both positive and negative. But I tell Dennis, and I still do a lecture. I said, "Do you think you want to trade places with me?" I'll go into your practice in your town. You come into my town. And I'm telling you, you can make more money. You probably can see more hyperbaric, more dentistry in a week. And you say, this is not for me. These people are crazy. It's nuts. It's insane. They should be happy because in their town, there are people that own, you know, own the, um, the, uh, the restaurant or own this. And they're, and they're, high, they're high profile people in the town. And, and that's what they can do. If they establish their identity as to who they are and the quality of, with the service they give and the product they give, they're going to grow, you know. But it like it doesn't happen overnight. You just don't put a shingle out anymore. Uh, you got to, you got to. It takes years, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. You know, I, I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas, and I'll never forget. It was August fourth, nineteen ninety, and I went out there to lecture, and it was the first time I've ever been there. I took my best friend from dental school, Craig Steichen, because I was scared. And here I was growing up in a town where the small, largest thing was a green silo. And I'll never forget, I was just kind of looking out the window, and I was looking out the window, and then all of a sudden I realized that was like a city. 
I mean, it was shocking. It was stunning. Me and Craig had never seen it. We went to the hotel. We dropped our stuff. We went down the street and started walking around. And the next thing I know, I told Stike, I said, my, my feet are getting sore. And he goes, well, dude, it's three in the morning. We've been walking for <laughs> seven hours. And it's like, oh, my God. I mean, it was that is the most mind boggling place in the world. Uh, you know how um, a lot of dentists are accused of diagnosing the apocalypse. They'll say, well, this is. This lady would shop at Walmart. But when I look at shoppers, I mean, sometimes the Walmart shopper goes to Nordstrom's to get a nice dress. Sometimes you eat a Taco Bell. Sometimes you go to a nice sit-down restaurant. Do you think dentists um, misdiagnose that all the people who want to get veneers are like young, hot, runway models? Um, is there a very common patient profile that goes to you? Or are they young, old, boy, girl? Are they everything? Or is it is it like the 80-20? Is 80% of all the women getting veneers, young, hot, beautiful ladies that could be that want to be a model in New York? T tell us what the patient profile is that seeks your services. You are right on. First of all, early on, we make a mistake. We prejudge the patients, the way they dress, the way they look, the questions they ask, who they refer from. You cannot do that. I would say that most of my patients are the patients that go out there and, you know, I would call Main Street America. I mean, it may be a little above average living in New York, but they go ahead and they never even understood what they would want to have. You've got to introduce them to the concept. You can't say, well, I'm not going to tell this patient he's eight or 10 years. I mean, how are they going to pay for eight or 10 years? I mean, they're going to leave my office. Well, they're not going to leave you off. If you believe in what you believe in, and you tell them, listen, I can do a bite set of patient today. One little bond of friend, too, the French girl, the French girl. And I said, you know, I said, no, no you need to do this. I'm not even going to do it for you. I'm going to show you in your mouth what we can do for you, and then we'll talk about it. But until you want to do if you don't think that you absolutely do not want to do this, then we'll consider it or it should go someplace else. The dentist cannot prejudge. Everybody, okay, is somebody who may need or want your services and don't even know about it because they don't even know what your services are. And the fact of the matter is that you're going to be shocked. It's one of the great shocking events in dentistry when all of a sudden someone said to me, yeah, I want to have these implants over here. And I'm, by the way, I don't want to my front teeth. They're a little crooked. Can you fix that too? I said, sure. We don't have to draw your teeth box. You go, are you serious? Oh, no one ever told me that. You go to the dentist 30 years. No one ever told them that. And that's what goes on. You know, dentists have to be proactive. Not reacting. They got to introduce the problem. You have a problem. You have a grinding away. Your teeth are getting worse. You get this going. You got to protect your teeth. We're going to make them healthier and make them better at the same time. Look better at the same time. How does that sound to you? How much is it going to cost? It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be worth investing. We have care credit. We have other ways to pay it. We, have, we can work things out. Maybe we can do it segmentally, not do the whole thing at one time. The dentist has to do this, and he needs a strong treatment coordinator. I have Jack in my office forever. She runs my life. She takes care of me. I could never live with it. I bought my hygienist for 20-something years. He's doing, you know, I mean, they believe in the people. These people come back not to see me, to see them. It's unbelievable. And they integrate new people in the staff all the time. And you want to know something? I feel great. You know why? Because I wish I could build a New York Knicks like I built my office. And it's incredible that it's all about that. And that's a turn. These are my family. These are the people I spend more time with every day. Dentists do the same thing. You got to take people in the, that are on your side that support you. Donald Trump told me one thing a long time ago. He said to me, "You cannot hire anyone unless they promote the brand. It's not good enough just to do the job. That's fine. They got to believe in you and promote the brand, and it's right. And all he needs is people behind him in this world in Congress to believe that the brand that he wants to promote America will work." instead of fighting all the time. But I, I, but there are a lot of things he's taught me over the years, and he's done it really. I mean, yeah, everybody's got their issues. No question about it. I do too. But I, I just want to let you know that you have to be people that are supportive of you, and that will make or break your practice. Not just how you prep the tooth, what material you use, but who is your team? Who's on your side? Who cares as much as you do? And that's hard to find, but you need it. You know, the greatest cosmetic lecture I ever attended in my life was uh – I flew to Atlanta, and I was connecting to uh, uh, San Paulo, Brazil, and I got to sit next to you in first class for nine hours from Atlanta to San Paulo, Brazil. 
I don't know. That was the most fun, the most interesting, the most informative. And, uh, and that was also the biggest conference I, I've ever lectured at in my life. There were 4,000 people. Do you remember that? Aesthetica 2000, San Paulo, Brazil? Yeah. Do you remember that? Uh, that was 17 years ago. I'm too old to remember any of that stuff. But I'll tell you this, Howard. I learned a lot from you, too. I learned a lot of things that you connect with a lot of dentists. Your style and who you are and everything else makes you absolutely believable and understandable. And your sense of timing and humor and your down-home basic being you, Howard Ferran, is a great thing for dentistry. And I mean that. It's always been that way. I haven't seen you in a while, and I sort of miss you. But when I heard when Jackie told me we were doing this kind of thing, of course I would do with you. You know, we're just two regular guys out there. We're just doing what we can. You know, um, you could say, you know, uh, Springsteen's a great uh, songwriter, a great performer. He's not a good dentist. I mean, uh, you could say that the top model in the world, uh, Uma Thurman, they're not, not good dentists. But they, I mean, they need us the same kind of way that we like what they do. So the value of what we do today is even greater than before. And I think the way you promote and the way you get people on this podcast and the way you've done things all dental town for all, all these years has been, I mean, you found, you found a niche for yourself, but a niche that is so needed for dentists out there and to get them motivated. Listen, millennials have problems today. I got a millennial, all right? And he's very really passionate. But the fact of the matter is that if they don't find something in their life you're passionate about, then they're going to miss out in their life. No matter what it is, I don't care what it is, but they got to find something passionate about you. I mean, maybe I'm passionate to a fault and being sane about that stuff, but if you really like what you do, then you're going to have, you know, part of your life will be very fulfilled. Life is tough enough anyway. Relationships and everything else are difficult. Patients are difficult. Staff are difficult. Overhead is difficult. Making a living is difficult. Everything else is stress difficult. If you can turn around and make it a joy, I know you do it as a joy. I know you are. I know how you are. You just exude that kind of thing. And I try and do it too. And when you do it, other people want to gravitate towards you. So the dentist can't be negative. They got to start thinking about the positive sides that they're lucky to be a dentist, lucky to be in this profession. When we first started out, no one wanted to be a dentist, no one wanted to go to the dentist. Now it's changing. The dental schools are totally full. There's a waiting list that are unbelievably long because they find out the profession is a craft, it's an artistry, it is a gift in terms of making someone younger and healthier, not just cosmetics, but the whole profession in general. And how we're, we're, you know, we're, we're going and melding it with professionals and, and, and doctors and everything else, some of the plasters and dermatologists and everything from sleep apnea and TMJ problems and periodontal problems, it's all about us. I mean, it's a whole, it's not gonna dry up. People are gonna need their teeth fixed. And depending upon what niche the dentist wants to be, they wanna do root canal and do it well, I think they should just do root canal, that's fine. You know, but whatever to satisfy them, they should not stop. They should be driven by people like you to go ahead and be the best they can be. They will get satisfied. They'll make a good living, living, and they have an opportunity for a great life. So, what if my homies want to go to your course? How, how do they see Larry lecture? Do you do any over the shoulders? What, what's what? What are you? What are you providing for dental? Uh, dental okay. education? Let me, let me- let me tell you what we do. And, and by the way, we're sort of a dinosaur. Years ago, we had Pack Live, we had LVI, we have, and they're still doing some of that stuff. And I just saw Bill the other day, and I saw Hornbrook the other day, and and I, it was great seeing him at a reunion at Legends at AECD. We all lectured there, and it was fabulous. But what we do is this: we have a level one, two, and three. It's a two weekend course, a month apart, and they provide a patient. We usually tell them to bring a patient, whether it be a staff member or a patient that goes ahead, and they do in level one basic, ten veneers, let's say what it might be, not a very difficult case. And we go ahead and we review the cases for them. Then there's level two, the first weekend, the first weekend is lecture, all Friday. I lecture for a couple of hours, then I have other doctors, my partner, Dr. Apple, who's a great dentist, he's one of the superstars out there today, no doubt, and all the others teach, and we teach a philosophy on how to do things to let them understand why and what we're doing. And then we get involved in practice management, we get involved in the whole philosophy of what we believe in. Saturday, they come in and they do the cases. They get to see the cases. They do two sessions back and forth, and they actually do the work. If they can't do it, they're one-on-one teachers from dentists that have been involved, accredited members of AC for years, and they get a chance to go ahead, and we let them do the work. We help them. We guide them along the way. Then they go ahead, and then we have a little cocktail party. They come back a month later. We have all lectures on Friday, different lectures for level two and three, and then we put the cases, and they cry. They all cry. We just did like, um, I think, 
40 something arches a few weeks ago. It was 25, 26 cases, some full upper and lower arches, and it's unbelievable in the morning. So what we do is the skills have to be learned, but tears have to learn, and the laboratory is right there. JC Kim Laboratory is right there to surround us walking around while we're doing this. It is an unbelievable experience. It's even more uplifting and more exciting than even what they learn. They learn the mindset. They travel around the world, and that's what we do. And I still do it. We um, we love it. You call if you can call Jackie in New York, 212-794-3552, and Jackie runs the show. She runs my life. She runs aesthetic advantage. Is she, is that who just talked to you, Jackie? Yeah. Tell her to come around and, and wave hi. Jackie, will you come say hi? She's a little camera shy, but come on, Jackie. Very camera shy. Camera shy, just say hello to Howie. You remember Howie. Here we go. Howie. Here's Jackie. You got to sit over here. <laughs> Hey, ask her some good questions. Hello, darling. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? You haven't changed since the last time I've seen you. <laughs> Neither have you. <laughs> so now, is all this information, the website is aestheticadvantage.com? That's A correct, yes. So A-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C, Aesthetic Advantage. And you said the phone number was 212-794-3552? That's correct. Okay, well, Jackie, you need to tell Larry that on that aesthetic advantage, it needs a Twitter. Come on, Trump's his patient. Trump, Trump won the election on Twitter. You need, it's good because uh, I could have retweeted that on Twitter and then when they got to work, they, they'd uh, see your link. Do you know how much trouble I can have by Twitter? <laughs> I'd be in the same bra shape he is. <laughs> You'd be tweeting at three o'clock in the morning? I don't know, that's when I get up for my first refreshment. I think he would be <laughs> tweeting without even knowing he was tweeting. <laughs> well, um, so Larry, I, I, if I got on my hands and knees and beg, we, uh, I think the best marketing, I mean, you don't need marketing. I mean, obviously you don't, you don't need it, but a lot of, uh, people, Everybody needs marketing. A, a lot of people who have like a two day or a three day hands-on course, whatever they'll go on, on dental town. We got a quarter million dentist. And we put up 411 courses, and they're coming up on a million views. If you put an hour course, kind of a greatest hits album of what level one, two, and three would be, or you could even do a one hour on one and a, what on what you learn, because I think it's a big jump for a lot of millennials to see a flyer, get on an airplane, go to big New York City. But I think if they saw an hour of you explaining what they're going to come and learn. They'd fall in love with you. It, it would um, deconstruct the sales process. Instead of just flyer to New York City, put an hour in the middle. I think that would be okay, What I'll do, Howard, also, not only that, I'll do a live demo. I'll have I'll go ahead over the shoulder and have them see me, and we'll, and we'll um, um, edit it to go ahead, how we do the temporaries, how prep preparation, how we talk to the patient, how we go ahead with the cementation, and give them a little overview of what we're talking about that they're going to be doing and how we do it every day. Howard, I do this every day. I can't believe I do this every day, Howard. I mean, we, honestly, we we have, I, we've had so many requests since night since we started the online scene in 2004. I we've had a request to have you put up a course there probably every three weeks since 2004. It would just be so amazing to get the man. I, because I love you and you're very handsome, I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> All right, it was my good looks that got you. Well. It's your good look and your swagger. I love your swagger. Well, you know what you, me and you both have in common, besides we're both dentists, or we both named our first son Eric, is that I still think that one thing that drives both of us is we have an incredible work ethic. I mean, gosh darn it, you and I both hustle. And I, I think a lot of kids sit on the couch and they, they think success to be handed to you. But, man, I, I've followed you around. I mean, I have followed you around in New York and I uh, – in your black Porsche. I mean, you would stop at restaurants just to press the flesh. You would stop here just to say hi to that guy. I mean, you, you were lecturing, had to run back to the office, see a patient. I mean, you're just, I mean, you were just the consummate marketer. I swear to God, I told everybody, I said, I didn't know if he was a dentist or if he was running for mayor. I mean, you're, you're a hustler. Wouldn't you say that, that you're, you have that work well, ethic? Both I of was us. a hustler. I learned it from my father, but more than that, I'd say that you know, I like people. You like people, too. And the fact of the matter is, my son says to me today, Dad, your best friends are the guys that park your car and that are the um, ushers in security at Madison Square Garden when you go to basketball games. I mean, I talk to people. 
they have lives that are not necessarily that exciting. If you can make it a little better for them, it just makes you feel good. I mean, we're lucky to be where we are today. We have a few shekels in our pocket, and we can go ahead and have a lifestyle. We want to do some, not everything, but we can do things. And I think most of these dentists today are be the same way. I mean, so the fact of the matter is that instead of looking at things like, oh, this is a bad thing, and i got friends of mine, and everything they look at, yes, but, unfortunately, horrible. You know, the idea is this. We do it with a smile. We get the same problems that we else have out there, but we go ahead and look at ourselves, and whatever it is, I don't know if it's God or this, we're blessed. We're followed or we're blessed. I almost died in a car accident 10, 11 years ago. I, I lost my ear. I had all kinds of problems. People said, what happened to me? And you know something? It didn't happen. Because of that, I was lucky. And I feel fortunate that I'm around. And I always feel fortunate that I did this. And I feel fortunate that I met people like you and other people out there. Dentists should not be competitive in terms of the fact of putting down other dentists. They should say, listen, this dentist can do a great job. He did a great job here. I can do this a little differently. Perhaps you may like it a little better. Perhaps it may fit a little better. We'll see. You know? And if they learn not the more they don't put down others, the more their patients will come to them and flock to them and respect them. People want to be around people that have a positive attitude, people that are fun. They don't want to have people that are downers, you know, and that's part of the whole thing. It's hard to teach that. It's hard to change that, but it's true. Well, I just want to tell you that you're the busiest man in Manhattan, and I just think it was just a complete honor that you – gave an hour of your life today to come on my show and talk to my homies. I know they loved it. Um, go to aestheticadvantage.com. You got to see the man. Uh, Larry, seriously, thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry. Like the saying goes, the rising tide lifts all boats. Your open wider book, every, every time you're on TV, every time everybody's talking about it, you're, 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 you're growing dentistry from Kansas to Kathmandu. So thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry. Howard, I want to tell you something. Um, we're still alive. We're still viable. We're still ticking. And we want, we need people to go ahead and be proteges and follow us and keep the ball rolling and make sure this thing doesn't stop because it's going to explode. It, the revolution is just starting all over again. It's going to explode. The world is crazy. There are problems around us. In our little niche, in our little world, in our little family, why can't we enjoy ourselves? Why can't we give others the benefit of our skills and talent and what we do? And that's what I implore dentists to do. They can take courses, not just my course, anything else out there. They can read other books out there. The book I have, I think, has some value. I hope they enjoy it and, they, and maybe they go ahead and give it to their patients and help them promote their practice. But more important than that, they got to have people like you out there to help them feel good about themselves. I am always available. I'll be glad to do this with you again. I will get involved with a course with you. I love you. I think you're great. I think you're insane. I think we're both insane, and that's why we're still smiling. Hey, will you do me one favor? Can you get uh, Jason J. Kim to come on the show? Because you mentioned his lab, which is jjkda.com. jjkda.com. That stands for Jason J. Kim Dental Aesthetics. And, I mean, if he's the lab man of Larry Rosenthal, I want to talk to that guy on this show. Yeah, and they're called Oral Designers Lab in New York. I think Jason would be great. I think Jason could show a lot of the dentists a lot of the stuff that's at a very, very high level. And he could tell them what he expects from the dentist and how the dentist could go ahead and communicate that to their patient. He can make them better dentists and make them more, more patients say yes. So I will definitely get him to come on. Oh, and if he, thanks, buddy. And whoever else you need. I mean, if you need some promotion or some other people to be involved that I may know or anything else, I recommend it totally. So you got my you got my blessing. Anything I can do for you guys, I will do it for you. I love you. From NBC News, this is Today. Before we go any further, can I tell you about sure. a book? I'm not going to be here uh, on for favorite things on Monday, so okay. I wanted to. My, and you know how everybody hates to go to the dentist? Yes. I love my dentist, and I have for like 30 years. He is an incredible character and a wonderful guy. He's got a new book called Open Wider, Guide to Smile and, and a Facial Aesthetics to Enhance Your Confidence, Appearance, and Overall Health. That's a long he, title. He, no, you know what? He's got a whole institute named after him. Oh, he does. I mean, he's, he's an amazing, he's not just a cosmetic dentist. He's, he's an extraordinary, great teacher. He's, uh, if you like our new president-elect uh, Donald Trump smile, it's because of him. It. He did if it. you like all the Uber models smile, it's because of him. If you like mine, 
Yeah, all right. Anyway, I'm happy for him. He's a wonderful guy. Congratulations, Larry. You can get it for 28 bucks, right, on Amazon.com. Yeah, pre-order on Amazon.